Okay, hello everybody. This is gonna be the second video we have going on here. Um, let me pull up the PowerPoint I'm gonna use real quick. There we go. Okay, so this one's gonna be about the article, Sarajevo, The End of Innocence on Blackboard. Just as I kind of echoed in the first video, make sure to read these and read these very well. Uh, like I said, they will be on the final exam. So, you know, print it out, highlight, take notes, do whatever you got to do to uh, really feel like you have a grip of these articles. Um, feel free to shoot me an email and talk to me in class too about um, this. I know a couple of you already have. Um, so without further ado, let's, I think this will be the shorter, the shorter one. I just recorded the first video, but then my audio got all screwed up. So I went and watched at the end and it, you couldn't even hear what I was saying without hearing like a big shriek. So that was a little unfortunate. So I will record it again for you fine, fine folks in class. I won't put you through that. But for now, let's just talk about Sarajevo here. So um, I'm sure a lot of this information right now will be echoed in class, uh, probably on Monday, I think on Monday, tomorrow. I'm recording this on Sunday, uh, but a little bit of the, of the prelude to World War One. I, I won't get super into the minutia like Dr. Dreifer probably will, but remember these conflicting kind of ideological uh, forces of imperialism and nationalism. And remember that nationalism is not just kind of a pride or an ultra patriotism or kind of like a, a military desire to see your country's needs uh, fulfilled. But it's also the, the way that we conceive and understand ourselves as a national identity. That, you know, how do we understand ourselves as being American or being British or being Russian or whatever? That how do we come to see those, those identities as, as kind of our overarching identity? And uh, for a lot of people, especially in Eastern Europe at this time period, those national identities are being built. And those national identities and those nationalisms are overtly clashing with the older uh, imperialisms of the late 19th uh, and early 20th century. For the purposes of World War I and Sarajevo, uh, it's specifically Serbian nationalism that will come to play a big role in the, in the coming of the war. Um, but remember that this is not something that is just happening in Serbia. It's not something that's just happening in the Balkans. It's not something that's just happening in Europe. This is something that is happening across the world that um, you know, even in the kind of big European powers that we talk about a lot in class that you know, Germany didn't become unified, a unified state until the later uh, decades of the, of the 19th century. And as a part of that military and political and economic kind of conquest and drawing together, they had to create a German nation and to turn people who had previously thought of themselves as Hanoverians or of Saxons or of uh, Bavarians or Württembergers or what have you, whatever of the dozens of German kingdoms they were, they had to take those people and physically and culturally and intellectually turn them into Germans. And that's kind of this nationalistic uh, quest that we see happening. It begun, you know, in full force back when we were talking about Napoleon, when France and its puppets had kind of uh, conquered a lot of continental Europe. And a lot of these identities are jump-started by the fact that people don't want to see themselves as French. So they have to see themselves as Hungarian or as uh, you know, Polish or as Serbian or as Greek or whatever. Um, so those identities have uh, roots uh, way hundreds of years back. Some, uh, I think a lot of times we uh, um, underestimate how new a lot of these identities are. Like I said, with Germany, um, or France too. France really, the, the identity of being French was something that was really only associated with Parisians or kind of cosmopolitan uh, urban people until you know the 17th century or really the 18th century that even today there are a lot of rural French people who speak other kind of languages. They're called patois, they're, they're dialects that aren't really French and that they're similar to French, um, but they're not wholly French. And they're, they're people who don't really understand themselves as being as French. Or they're 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 uh you know uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but there's a bevy of other cultural identities that people across Europe uh, still kind of hold on to, but it's it's mostly died out today. But in the 1700s and the 1800s, and and for some people into the 1900s, these identities are still being built. The identities of that we think of today as being concrete and movable, uh, 
of, of the nation state identities, these are really, really new things and are really, really relative and constantly moving things. Uh, with those kind of nationalistic uh, developments, there's still this old force of imperialism also uh, hovering over Europe. And I, I know a lot of the imperialist stuff we talked about, even in the old the article, uh, the imperialist article is not actually about Europe. It's about what's going on in, in Southeast Asia or India or the West Indies or the East Indies or Africa. But these kind of broader imperial conquests still have an impact on the older imperial uh, conflicts of Europe that you know, England, France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Russia, um, while the fighting and the kind of manpower that they have may be shifting to uh, the periphery, I guess it's not really the periphery, but what they would see as the periphery as these kind of other areas of the globe, those conflicts still have a great resonance in Europe. And you know, those scramble for, for power, for power politics, for trade, for resources, for technology, uh, leads to significant cultural attitudes uh, shifting at home. And I think that the best example of this, is, this isn't in the article, this is just um, outside information that you know, traditionally we think of uh, for the most of this class, Britain and France have been the two kind of diametrically opposed enemies in Europe that if you go back to the, the wars of the revolution and to Napoleon and kind of on, uh, Britain and France are, are opposed. In the kind of late, the first decade of the 1900s and the early 1910s, there's a huge shift in uh, both France and Britain that they no longer see each other as kind of uh, primal enemies, but they see Germany now as the biggest kind of threat to their imperial standing and, and their uh, emerging nationalisms. And this is kind of, there's, there's a book from I think 1900 where, uh, a British author writes about uh, French soldiers digging a tunnel under the English Channel, popping up in England and kind of conquering England. Um, and that was kind of one of these last gasps of seeing England and France as the diametrically opposed forces. By the 1910s, there's uh, books, book after book coming out that no longer is worried about French troops, but is worried more about German dreadnoughts, the battleships that we talked about. Um, that you know, Britain and, and Germany get into this naval race that we can kind of equate to our space race in the couple decades later, that there's a technological race for who can build the better battleship. And you know, British people are now way more worried about that than they are about France. And uh, with the Entente, we even started to talk about, it's not even that Britain and France are no longer enemies, but they are actually kind of drawing together and becoming allies. So it's kind of shifting imperial, uh, uh, allegiances along with the, the growing nationalism, specifically in Eastern Europe, are really what kind of paved, paved the way to World War I. Um, and as we talked about in class again uh, last week, I'm sure we'll talk about it again on Monday, um, the kind of understanding that we have when war breaks out is England, France, and Russia versus Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Talk a little bit more specifically about what happens in Sarajevo in 1914. Um, these nationalisms and this kind of conflict between nationalism and imperialism is really at the heart, not just of, of the road to World War I, but also of the specific conflict in Sar Sarajevo. Um, you know, Serbs and a lot of other Balkan people, the Balkans being that peninsula where Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece are. Um, a lot of these places were controlled by Austria-Hungary but did not want to conceive of themselves as being Austrian. You know, they had different linguistic, historical, social, cultural kind of traditions that uh, they wanted to take those traditions and turn it into a national identity. So, you know, being Serbian, being Bosnian, being Croatian, these were identities that were flourishing uh, in the first decades of the 20th century. And that came in direct conflict with the, with the Austrian-Hungarian empire that wanted to continue to exert political control over these areas. Um, even though uh, Serbia was demanding independence and being supported by Russia who, didn't, who couldn't have cared less about self-determination and independence for the Serbian people, they just wanted to stick it to Austria-Hungary. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the Archduke of Austria-Hungary uh, in 1914 is a guy named Franz Ferdinand, and he, for some reason, I have no idea why, chooses to visit Sarajevo, which is the capital of Serbia, on a day in which the Serbs celebrate their nationalism and celebrate calls for independence. It's, it's kind of like 
the precursor to their Independence Day, uh, a big celebration. And during the celebration, a member of the Black Hand, which was a uh, ultra-nationalist -natural Serbian group that wanted to overthrow the Austria-Hungarian Austria Empire using overt violence, um, a member of that group named Gavrilo Princip. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know the story I was just talking with uh, one of my friends about what they know about World War One, and she was telling me that she knew the whole, the whole story about Princip, you know, throwing a, a bomb, the bomb misses, he skulks off to a sandwich shop and comes out of the sandwich shop a couple minutes later, and the Archduke's driver had taken a wrong turn and was now driving right in front of Princip again, and Princip pulls a pistol out and shoots the Archduke and his wife dead in the street, kind of a very serendipitous, very coincidental um, turn of events that would ultimately, as the article points out, change the whole course of, of world and human events. Um, and like the article asks, you know, how does this political murder in Serbia, this kind of conflict between uh, Austria-Hungary and Serbia, how does that become World War I? Well, part of it is that the Austro-Hungarian Empire is a weakened beast at this point. It's, it's without a doubt the weakest of the continental powers. And Franz Ferdinand is kind of the last of its heirs. The, the guy who is currently the, the, the emperor of the arch, the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire is aging. His other sons and other potential heirs have all been killed in other imperial conflicts, or I think actually his, his top son had killed himself. So Franz Ferdinand was kind of the last hope for the future, for the future vitality of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So when he's shot dead, uh, the Austrians respond uh, in full force. And the Russians, not wanting Austria to become powerful, you know, once again, this is that imperial conflict coming back into Europe. Uh, Russia issues a hasty war mobilization order. And now Russia and Austria-Hungary are kind of two guys playing chicken with, with each other. And that kind of manliness and overt aggressiveness and overt strength and not wanting to appear weak that I talked about in the, the imperialist article and that we've talked about a lot in this whole class has now pushing these two countries towards war and the kind of imperial understandings and entangling imperial alliances that we see in France, Britain and Germany will draw them into this conflict between uh, Serbia, Austria-Hungary and, and Russia. So, the kind of the last part of the article that I want to talk about is, is this kind of shattering of the imperial veneer. That up until this point, all of these empires, Britain, Germany, France, Russia, whatever, saw that kind of overt aggressiveness and that, that really big emphasis on martial prowess and military success and you know, war being a very, very good thing, both for our people and for our country and for the world, that wholly gets shattered by World War I. Um, you know, they, they go into this with a great overconfidence and an ignorance about what war can be. Um, it's not a European example, but if you have read anything about the Spanish-American War in 1898, um, John Hay, the, the U.S. Secretary of State during this time period, described the Spanish-American War as a, quote, splendid little war. And this is how they thought about these kind of imperial conflicts, is that there wasn't really a whole lot at stake. You know, there were casualties, yes, but it wasn't a whole lot of casualties. The, the, most of the death was happening on the, the side of native peoples who, because of racism and because of ethnocentrism and because of kind of a, a lack of cultural relativism, um, white imperialists didn't really care about the deaths on the other side. They, they cared about their deaths. And as long as they could minimize those, these wars were heroic wars of conquest. And there was nothing really bad. And kind of on the, the counter side, it wasn't even that it was bad, it was that these wars were central to the understanding of their national identities and to advancing their national interest. So war was, you know, a, a lot of times if we think about like World War II being the most prominent war in most people's mind, um, a lot of Americans, if you watch the Ken Burns documentary or watch a lot of other kind of popular and public histories about World War II, they won't call it a good war or a just war. They'll just call it a necessary war. And that's an idea that definitely comes out of the interwar period, that before World War I, these imperial powers absolutely saw war as not just a necessary or a justified thing, but a good thing and a thing that was absolutely necessary for the survival of their national interest. And I think the, the uh, poet Charles Piguet here that we, that we see in the article who they show a couple stanzas of him in 1914, right? His war is breaking out. Um, you know, 
happy are those who have died in great battles, lying on the ground before the face of God. It really kind of characterizes that idea of uh, it is an honor to die for your country. It's an honor to fight and die for your country. And these imperial um, identities and these national identities are things worth dying for. Um, and those kind of uh, perceptions are wholly shattered by the new technology, the new types of warfare in World War I, mustard gas, uh, other types of gases. You know, there's no longer, longer battles that you know, a, a lot of people thought this would be uh, a repeat of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, where you know, a German Austrian army would march to a city between uh, Germany and France, like Sedan in 1870, and there would be a showdown between uh, British and French forces and, and German and Austrian forces. And that one battle would just decide who won the war. They would just go back home and it would be a quick little war. Or as John Hay said in 1898, you know, a splendid little war. They weren't prepared for continuous fronts for, you know, four or five years of, of planes, of machine guns, of grenades, of new kind of bombs, of things that killed wholesale and indiscriminately. Um, because beyond those kind of martial ideas about war being a good thing, you know, the article talks about in France, Le Belle Epoque, or in, or in Vienna, the kind of cultural and artistic and intellectual um, progress that is being made is that the kind of imperial wealth that these countries bring back to Europe creates a lot of artistic goodness. You know, there's, there's art, there's uh, in France, a lot of great artists and writers come from this, this period, La Belle Epoque. Um, in Vienna, Sigmund Freud, a lot, there's a ton of great thinkers and kind of cultural uh, advancements happening on continental Europe and in Britain during this time period that those kind of thinking and seeing those things as the main thing that's happening in the world is no longer true. Now, the main thing that's happening in the world is death. And in World War I, you know, there's 18 million people killed uh, both soldiers and civilians, and there are 20 million uh, wounded. You know, this is a tremendous amount of people dead. You know, there are memories of, of men who are no longer there. That in the imperialist article, these men who Britain loved to think of as superior and exceptional and strong and bigger and more manly than anyone else, you know, that manliness meant nothing against mustard gas. That manliness meant nothing against the bullet and machine gun. It meant nothing against... Uh, you know, the barbed wire, the no man's land, all the kind of uh, things that leveled the field in World War I. Um, when what good was a strong, manly man if he was dead and he was buried in the fields of France? That's, you know, this absolutely shattered people's conceptions of what the world was supposed to be, of what war was supposed to be, of what imperial politics was supposed to be. And, and the article brings up that question that they were all asking themselves, what had it all been for? What had 20 million people died for? What had another 20 million been maimed for? That it just seemed to be over nothing, over these kind of really surface level imperial conflicts about strength and about manliness and about power. But, you know, when you see that kind of devastation, uh, I, I think I'll probably send you an article, or not an article, but a video from the John Merriman Yale Courses uh, lecture, who he, he brings actually in a guest lecture to talk about the actual psychological impact that losing this many people does. You know, the generation after World War II, or after World War I, excuse me, is called, you know, this lost generation. There are people who have lost limbs, who have lost uh, mental abilities, who are traumatized. And, and just beyond it, there are absolutely millions of people dead who could have existed, but no longer did. So World War I and kind of this very banal, boring, simple beginning to World War I um, absolutely changes the course of, of uh, Western civilization in the course of, in many ways, uh, world civilization. And unfortunately, as the article points out too, the, the ways that they try to shift from this imperial culture uh, does not work and ultimately leads to World War II. And even after World War II, it's, it's, we haven't done a great, a great job of totally ending this culture of, of military uh, prominence. But anyway, that's all I'll talk about for that article. Um, like I said, please read it multiple times. It will be on the exam. It will be key. Um, I'm not sure if he will have you do an essay question about it, but at, at this point in time, I'm assuming he will do a short essay question about these, uh, these articles. So I cannot stress how important 
reading and understanding and really having a good grasp of these articles uh, will be for success in the final exam. Thanks, guys. Stop my sharing here.